Good afternoon. My name is Eva Krajewska, and I'm counsel for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, going back to before the emergencies orders and the options that your ministry was considering. And if I could ask the registrar to put up, uh, pull up SSM.CAN.403761. This is a uh, memo that was attached to an email, Mr. Sevilla, that you sent to uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland. Uh, on February 8th at uh, 1700 hours minus five. I think that's right, minus five. Um, and do you, do you recognize this memo, sir? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, so these are two, these are, uh, in this memo, you lay out three options uh, to the minister, or the deputy prime minister. The first is the use of a, the Bank Act. The second option is um, redacted on the basis of cabinet confidence. Uh, I've asked my friend at the DOJ if she would reconsider that, and I, I appreciate that it will take some time. And then the third option is moral suasion, and this is not something that you discussed with Commission Counsel this morning. And I just want you to take a look at that second paragraph where uh, I think it was the, the minister's expectations to ask bank CEOs to remain vigilant in their review of business relationships to ensure that they're not being used to support illegal activities. And um, uh, is, that, is that one of the considerations that was given to uh, Minister Freeland into how she should deal with this situation? No, what this is, is just... Um a summary of possible approaches that could be used. Um, these are not um, and shouldn't be construed as recommendations to the minister in any way. And the description that you see in the second paragraph is really about, well, if one were to go down the path of moral suasion, here's the kind of thing that it would involve. Okay. And, and when you talk about support illegal activities, you would have to define what that means in these circumstances, correct? Uh, yes. And I think you stated earlier today that the emergencies, the declaration of emergencies and the orders underneath it defined what those ac illegal activities would be. The emergencies acted, that's my understanding. Yes, it did. Thank you. And now, if I can move on to the scope of the measures, and many of these questions will be to you, Mr. Sabia, and to you, Ms. Jacques. Um, you, you agree that the emergency measures order prohibited any entity as defined in Section 3, which covered both provincial and federal institutions from dealing with any property held by a designated person, right? That was the, that, if I'm, par you'd agree with that can characterization you, can you pull of the order. Up, uh, section three. Do you have it with? The, do you have section three before you? If not, I'll pull it up. Yes. Oh no! Wait, I left it at my chair. Um, Sajid, can you help me with the SSM number? Uh, if you could please pull up. Um, SSM dot CAN dot four zeros one nine one one underscore REL dot zero 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 one. So this is the emergencies measures order, which is the financial order, and section three is the one that covers the institutions that um Okay, well, I have the I have the wrong I have the wrong document. Okay, there is a list of institutions that are covered by the by the order. Correct? Those include financial institutions, credit yes. unions, insurance companies. Those cover both provincial and federal institutions. Correct? That is accurate. Right, and it prohibit it 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 prohibits those financial institutions from dealing with the property of any designated person. That's correct. Right. And that essentially freezes their assets, the designated person's assets. Yes, they can suspend dealings with those individuals, and it could lead to uh, the freezing of... Uh, freezes an account, not necessarily. 
of that kid. Well, it freezes their ability to deal with their property held at those institutions. Yes, I, I see you're Bank nodding. Accounts. Sorry, we need an audible. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, and it applied, you saw that it applied to joint accounts, to registered savings accounts, and to investment accounts. That is true. And you're aware that the Canadian Bankers Association voiced concerns to both you and the RCMP about the scope of these orders. I don't recall the CBA voicing concerns with the scope of the orders. I, I do not recall that. Do you remember any representatives from banking institution raising concerns about the scope of the orders? The the scope, no, but the impact, I mean, one concern that was raised with res respect to uh, uh, the impact it may have with respect to child support. It's the only concern that I recall. Okay, do you remember that they asked whether it applied to joint accounts? That's very possible, and if they did, I would have said yes. Right, and you, your office prepared or someone at the department prepared a kind of ongoing and consolidated question and answers, uh, kind of an FAQ for banks, correct? Well, not for banks. I mean, we had... Uh, Sorry, I say banks. I mean, for financial institutions. I mean, we had prepared some, some a frequent question for internal purposes, yes. Uh, this is, if I can just pull up, ssm.can.com. Seven zeros, two. And I think this is the consolidated FAQ. Um, and it, it, there were questions about, like, correct, thank you. And no, page number six. Um, scroll down to RCMP, please. There we go. When we say accounts, what exactly is being referred to? So those are the types of accounts that this would apply to, correct? Yes. Um, and if we go to page seven, there were questions about whether small donations were being investigated. Yes. And uh, the, your response or the RCMP response was that they weren't, correct? They were not being investigated. Yes, that was not the focus of uh, their investigation. But you'd agree that on the face of the order, um, small donations were captured on the face of the order. And Mr. Sevilla, I think you even provided that advice to Minister Freeland at some point. I don't recall. I may, I honestly don't recall that, but um... I mean, I think that's true. Yes, they were captured. I think captured. that's true that they were captured, but nothing. Okay, nothing. I will. I just put it for reference for the record yeah. that. And on those small donations, just just to specify, yes, they were captured. But it's important to note that certainly uh, the order was not retroactive. So any donations that would have been given prior to the Emergencies Act being uh, enacted uh, were not captured. And as we said uh, previously, it's important that you look at the context as to. When we came about to draft the order, we didn't know how the situation were evolved, uh, would evolve, but in the application of the order, certainly the focus was not uh, on those donations. Correct. So, and, and Ms. Jacques, I think it was you who provided answers to those questions at ssm.can6054, uh, where Minister Freeland had questions with respect to the order, and Mr. Sevilla, you asked uh, for responses on those questions, and Ms. Jacques, you provided the answers in red where you stipulated. This is on... Can we see you? I, I know. I'm just going to talk while they pull it up, otherwise I run out of time. <laughs> so <laughs> It'd be good to, to read you it. Will, you, you will, you will, I would for sure give you a chance to Thank see you. it. The question was, and what about people who were never at the protest but made donations? And your response was, as stipulated in the order, it is possible that a person who indirectly funded the illegal protest for the benefit of a person involved in the protest had their account frozen. This would only occur if they made a donation after September 15th, which is as uh, you were saying. February 15th. February 15th, uh, it was not retroactive. So if you go to page two, um, that there's the question 
uh, the second paragraph. Do you see that? Uh, and what, peop what about people? That yes, that, so yes, that was the question for Minister Freeland, and then your answer is in the um, less dark font. Yes. Okay, and, and I think some of the uh, financial institutions asked if they were able to exercise some humanitarian exceptions as well to the orders, and maybe this is what you were referring to as child support, correct? And certainly we, yeah, we told them to... to uh... And, and as they have, use their good judgment in applying the, this order throughout, yes. And uh, some, they also asked if they could continue to process automated payments uh, from the accounts, correct? That I do not recall if they asked me that question. Okay. And the order also applied to uh, auto insurance, correct? Yes. Yes, but the RCMP decided not to communicate with insurance companies as they wanted to ensure that it would be safe for vehicles to leave the demonstration. Yeah, now this is an important point because it goes to um, what we were trying to accomplish here. So that created the possibility um, that that could occur. Um, in, a, in reality, in actuality, it never occurred, um, but it did have uh, a helpful incentive effect, to use that word again, uh, with respect to um, wanting to find a peaceful solution uh, to these disruptions. So uh, I, the RCMP's approach to this was, I think, completely appropriate. The, the risk to the truck owner was there um, but action was not taken because if, act if the action had actually been taken, it could have, in certain circumstances, impeded the movement of the truck, which nobody wanted. But it did create an issue of uncertainty that a truck driver would have to assess and therefore hopefully encourage the truck driver to leave peacefully, which was the objective all along. So, Mr. Sibia, I just want to, with respect to that answer, I think to me, the order did more, the order did, would have allowed the RCMP to ask for that person's insurance to be canceled. And what the RCMP did is that it did not exercise their discretion under the order to do that. But the order on its face and, and the insurance company could have proactively canceled that truck driver's insurance, and then it would not have been safe for that but truck driver. But it's instructive that, ne that that never happened. Right. So it's, an, it's good that it did not happen, that, that that part of the order was not exercised. It's, it's, it's positive that it had the effect that it had, which was creating the possibility that that might happen, but that it never actually happened. That's an almost ideal combination. So in, in kind of economic terms, it created a microeconomic incentive. It did. Um, and I want to go back to the issue of w the, what happened between the financial institutions and the RCMP. It was not just that the RCMP provided information to financial institutions, but under the order, the financial institutions were obligated to provide reporting to either the RCMP or CSIS with respect to the freezing of accounts, correct? Yes. So it was on, there was the financial institutions onus to ensure that they were in compliance with the order. When they had information, to, yes, I mean, it Not was just when they had information. No, no, but do you mean it's their responsibility to, to be compliant with the law? Yes. And also it, there is a clause that's that they need to share information that they have with the RCMP and or CSIS. Correct. And so, uh, Ms. Jacques, when you mentioned earlier an indemnity that was provided, that indemnity was only provided to financial institutions if they complied with the order. It did not provide... an a, an indemnity to financial institutions not to comply with the order or not to report to the RCMP, correct? That is accurate. Right. So the financial institutions, if, as you say, they decided to exercise their discretion for humanitarian or other purposes, they were taking the legal risk for doing so. 
It was their it was their decision to make and do the assessment and consult internally, you know, and and receive the proper advice on their decision. Because they would receive a list of names or vehicles from the RCMP, and then they would have to report back to the RCMP of all the lists of accounts that they froze, and so the RCMP could compare both lists later and decide whether the financial institution complied with its legal obligations. I don't know if there was any such exercise of, by the RCMP to review compliance with the order. I've, I've never heard that in the past. But, but, the, but the order provided for that information sharing. It was to provide for the information sharing to help the, uh, the RCMP in, uh, in, in pursuing some maybe investigation. Yes. And then, in term, and then I understand... No, not to sorry. go back, not for the RCMP to take account. That was not the purpose. It was sh to share information to allow the RCMP to do their job. But it could, be, it could have been used to decide whether there had been compliance. It could be read that way. I, it was not intended that way. I find that to be a stretch. Okay. And in terms, and I understand that your department received aggregate information of how much was uh, frozen by financial institutions. You did not receive the specific accounts, but you received the aggregate numbers, correct? From the CBA, yes. From the CBA. And um, did I, I want to, if I could take you to ssm.can. Five zeros two zero nine. This is a long email chain uh, between Deputy Prime Minister Freeland's office and the uh, and your department regarding the enforcement of the Emergencies Act. And if we could go to the last page of this document, page eight. Um, this is on. Uh, February 16th, which is one day after the order is made public, uh, Alexandre, Alex at Lawrence, who's the director of communication for Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, asks for tangible figures that could be made public the next morning about how much, uh, about the enforcement measures. And if, if you go up, I mean, I think you were, I think you, I'm not sure if you personally were, were in communications, but your office was in communication with the Deputy Prime Minister and to ensure that she had updated numbers of how the number of accounts that were frozen and the quantum that was frozen, both were, were being provided to the Deputy Prime Minister, correct? Well, certainly we provided the, the information, uh, usually uh, via uh, Michael. Through Mr. Sevilla? Yes. Yeah, so we were... Um no mystery here. We were uh, wanting to track this information. Um, again, as you've said, not with respect to individual names, et cetera, but aggregate data. Uh, we were wanting to track that one to see uh, whether or not this activity w was actually underway, that, that uh, what we had set out to do was actually underway. And second, um, Again, and this is, you know, very important. Um, we were tracking it because the whole intent here was to have this in place for as short a period as possible so that it could be, um, uh, that this kind of activity could be removed as quickly as possible because hopefully it was no longer needed. Uh, because if it had the intended effect of bringing a peaceful end or contributing to uh, bringing a peaceful end uh, to these these disruptions, then mission accomplished, and this whole thing should 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 go away. So, in the interest of being able to do that as promptly as possible, yes, we were tracking this fairly carefully. And as you know, um, I think uh, the I think as of February what the twenty first or twenty second, um, pretty much all of these accounts uh, had been uh, had been unfrozen. So it was actually quite. It, it, it came and went quickly, which is what our intent was at the time, because it, it uh, contributed to the peaceful end in a way that, that we had intended. And Mr. Tibi, let me just pick up on that last point that you stated, that um, by the 22nd, you're aware that the RCMP had communicated to financial institutions that they should begin unfreezing certain accounts, correct? Well, yes, because the disruptions, because as the disruptions were were uh, coming to an end, the RCMP was doing a good job of uh, communicating that 
uh, to the financial institutions, and they were quickly unfreezing accounts. And I, I'd suggest that there's also maybe a third purpose to Mr. Lawrence's email, which is that I think the Deputy Prime Minister wanted to be in a position the next morning at the press conference to inform the public that measures are being taken. Yeah, look, I can't speculate as to what Alex's purpose was uh, or behind that, that email. The minister wanted to be kept in the loop on, um, on the level of activity and whether we were seeing um, progress here, and uh, we certainly kept her informed of that. Thank you. This is going to be my last question, which is with respect to FinTrack, I understand from the FinTrack report that they did not see an elevated level of suspicious transactions or a noticeable change in uh, transaction levels during the period of the Freedom Convoy. And, and you agree with that, correct? Well, I think the that period from the invocation of the Emergencies Act to when the Emergencies Act was then rescinded or removed was such a short period of time that it's, you know, I think quite logical. I think there were only, uh, I can't, don't there, hold there me to the number five or six transactions um, that did uh, surface as a result of that because we were talking about a period of, what, six or seven days. Right, but I think FinTrack's report is more than that. Even in January, even to the lead up to the convoy and before the emergency period, they did not see an increase in suspicious transaction reporting under the PCMLF. Yeah, the, the issue there, of course, as you know, is that because the perimeter of what FinTrack was actively um, reviewing was probably narrower than it should have been uh, because it didn't include crowdfunding and it didn't include payment processors, that clearly that was... Um, that was a gap, and that gap needed to be addressed, which we did temporarily on a temporary basis in the Employment Act, in the um, Emergencies Act, and then on a longer-term basis in in legislation and regulations that that uh, followed. Thank you very much, and thank you, Commissioner, for the indulgence.